Welcome everyone, this is Curtin's channel. Now we are back to our two episodes of two Semerality Champions and Comparison. Featured by Wild Rick, Black of Legends versus the Mobile Legend by Gang. But before that, please like and subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click the bell button. You will be notified to our new next episode video. Let's do this! Vladimir is a character that lived for so long history lost track of who he is. Or rather, what? Noxian archives tell old legends of a prince in a kingdom threatened by the Darkin, also known as God Warrior, that moved north into eastern Belarus. The king was likely to lose his crown, should the Darkin claim his kingdom. So in order to show them his loyalty, the king traded in one of his sons as a political hostage. The idea was that the Darkin would kill his son should his loyalty be broken. But the king had many heirs waiting in line for the throne, and with Vladimir being the youngest prince, he would likely never get his turn on the throne. And so the king never really cared for him. To the Darkin, mortal lives were just pawns on the battlefield, disposable and using. The Darkin, however, were immortal. They themselves learned how to craft their flesh and transmute blood, giving them the mastery over life itself. But living in high standards, Vladimir thought himself above just mere mortals. And therefore he thought he was worthy of such power as well. And over his time spent with the Darkin, he built up their trust, and Vladimir became the first mortal to be permitted to study the art of blood magic. This devotion earned him a spot in his patron's warhose, and Vladimir would carry out the Darkin's will on lesser beings using his newly acquired Hemomancy. Remember that during these times the Darkin were at war, and every warhose was devoted to and worshipped only a single Darkin. So Vladimir wasn't a patch to the Darkin in general, he was loyal to a single gold boy, and as time passed, his loyalty affected his personality. Suddenly Vladimir was governing their followers with as little mercy as the Darkin themselves. But eventually the reign of the cruel tyrants had to end. The story said that how it happened is described in legends. But we know that a Dargonian aspect, very similar to Zoe, gave mortals the knowledge to steal the Darkin away. All of that was in the Twilight of the Gods story. Anyway, the legend speculates that Vladimir's master wasn't imprisoned as so many other Darkin. Instead, he was slain by his own followers. And the few mortals who survived fled with whatever knowledge of blood magic they had. Remember this part for any future blood magic stories that may appear. The story specifically states that some people survived and fled away with the knowledge of blood magic. So if Hemomancy ever appears outside of the Noxian lands, it doesn't have to be just Darkin influence. Maybe some of these survivors started their own goals. Either way, what nobody knows is that it wasn't the followers who killed Vladimir's master. It was Vladimir himself who struck the final blow. And by doing so, he absorbed the maddening power and prolonged his own life. Decades later, when the cruel reign of Mordekaiser terrorized the barbaric lands of Beloran, the legend of Vladimir grew, and it was said that a mythic and bloodthirsty fiend haunted the coastal cliffs of eastern Beloran. Remember that after the Darkin War was over, everything was in ruins, and life in Beloran returned back to mostly barbaric times. Vladimir demanded young lives and savage worship from the local tribes. Until the day, a pale sorceress approached this barbarian god with an offer. The two feasted together as equals, and showcased their dark powers in a dark and twisted performance. This is how the pact between Vladimir and Leblanc started. Over the centuries, more dark warlords joined them in their games of politics and wars, and soon the Cabal grew into the hidden power that manipulated the throne of Noxus for more than a thousand years. They would be known as the Black Rose. In the past, Vladimir never schemed plans from the shadows, and instead he acted as an influential leader. He did go into hiding when necessary, but eventually he would always emerge again in a brand new lifetime. By doing this, Hemomancy found its place in Noxian military, and the newly found blood mages formed the Crimson Circle, a cult dedicated as much to Vladimir as to blood magic itself. For the following years, everything went well. Noxus was in a powerful state after claiming the coast of Ionia, and the Black Rose's influence on the throne was ever stronger. But everything changed when Jericho Swain returned from the battlefields, killed the previous Grand General, and dramatically changed the political landscape. Swain's goal was to remove the corrupting heart of Noxus that influenced the previous leaders, and such he began hunting down the members of the Black Rose. This forced Vladimir to go back into hiding again, 
and let legends cover his tracks. But it seems that this time around, Vladimir will emerge too soon, as the stains from his previous lifetime did not disappear yet. And it seems likely that Swain himself began to grasp Vladimir's true nature. Sensing this new conflict coming to Noxus, and remembering his time at the peak of the Darkin War, Vladimir knew it was time to stop hiding and renew his glorious past. This was the summary of Vladimir's bio, but we get a lot more information from the short story called Art is Life. This story introduced a brand new character called Mora. She is a poor and talented painter that lives in a studio with a group of other poor and talented painters. Mora received an invitation to the Mortora district, also known as the Iron Gate, and there she would paint a portrait of a rich and powerful man. Of course she suspected it was Vladimir, because almost no one else lived in that area, and the other painters in their group encouraged Mora that this is the opportunity of her life. Except for the one guy that was clearly more talented than her, and he was just jealous that he wasn't picked instead. So Mora followed the instructions in the invitation and got to the Iron Gate. Most of Noxus was very noisy even at night. People were singing marching songs, swords clashing sounded from the arena, widows cried, drunken soldiers shouted, and dragehounds howled at nearby prey. Noxus was very noisy. But the district around the Iron Gate was dead silent, with the streets empty. When Mora got there, she was surprised how much free space there was around her. Usually everything is cramped. At the center of the empty plaza was a statue of a headless knight wielding a spiked mace. You don't have to second guess that this was a headless statue of Mordekaiser, the legendary warlord king of the past that ruled this place. Mora kept following the instructions until she got to a large mansion. She didn't need the instructions because everyone knew who lived here. But just as the letter said, the main doors were open and Mora stepped inside. This entire place was built from different styles of architecture, indicating that it was built over many centuries. And the heart of the mansion seemed to be built around some ancient Cheriman temple. As Mora continued through the entrance, she had to go through the mansion's gardens. There she saw exotic flowers that she had never even heard about. And there were hundreds of colorful butterflies mixed between the flowers. Upon closer inspection, Mora realized that the butterflies had patterns on their wings similar to the crest of Noxus. She then enjoyed the scent of one particularly beautiful bloom. Its petals were flame red. Mora was experienced with mixing flowers for her paints, but she had never seen a red color like this one. The reason for this is because this was a very rare flower. It fits the description of the one we read about in Maokai's story, the Night Bloom. So the reason why she had never seen it is because it is extinct. The last Night Bloom grew on the Blessed Isles before the relation. Mora couldn't resist the flowers and she plucked a few petals from the nearest plant. The remaining petals immediately curled inwards and the stem bent away in fear. That's when Mora felt terrible here. After that, she stepped inside the main hall, as instructed in the letter, despite nobody being there. It was a dark room with long galleries to her left and right. She just stood there alone. It took a while, but a voice finally answered her. It was Vladimir, although she couldn't see him. At this point, Mora was very nervous, but her conversation with Vladimir went well, despite still not knowing where he is. It seemed as if Vladimir's voice was all around her. Everything was fine until Vladimir asked her how she liked the garden. That, Mora knew, was a trap question. Vladimir then explained what the place was all about. The gardens are full of rare species from all across Runeterra. And he even mentioned that the flower she killed was a night bloom, a flower native to a chain of islands in the east where Vladimir hid before it was destroyed. And after it was, he took some seeds from a nature spirit grove and brought them back to Belrand. Yes, he is talking about the Blessed Isles and about Maokai, who was protecting the last night bloom. This is interesting because the Blessed Isles were home to many powerful mages. Even Tyrus, the master of Rise, came from its capital city. And now we know that Vladimir lived here for a while as well. Which makes you wonder if Vladimir knows more about the world runes. I mean, obviously he did live through the rune wars. Anyway, the conversation between Mora and Vladimir shifted to his paintings. There were a great many of them around. All painted in different styles from known masters from different centuries. And at first, Mora didn't believe that all of them was him. There was a painting showing Vladimir in ancient Cheriman armor, holding a banner depicting sights that we very well know. And in the painting, there were Darkins standing behind him. It showed Vladimir's blue eyes, which suggested that this was a painting from times when his master was still alive, since Vladimir's eyes turned red after that. And since the banner revealed a sight, we might assume that his master was Ras. But the story also said that Vladimir's master wasn't imprisoned. He was killed by Vladimir. So maybe Rast later picked up the sight of Vladimir's master. Maybe Rast isn't the original wielder of the sight, but he was just later imprisoned in it. Then Vladimir began telling his story. And this is where we learned about his real past. 
Just like it was said in the bio, Vladimir revealed that he was a prince traded to the Darkin as a hostage, and that his father, the king, never cared about his life. And within a year, the king even broke his loyal oath, which meant that Vladimir was to be sacrificed. But instead of killing Vladimir, his master offered him something more amusing. He gave Vladimir the chance to lead the Darkin's armies against his own father, which Vladimir did and he destroyed his father's city. After presenting the king's head to his master, Vladimir's loyalty was sealed. Vladimir even revealed that he did it because he would have never been the king otherwise. There were so many princes in line in front of him, he would have never lived long enough to see his birthright. For slaying his own father, the reward his master gave him was the power to defy death. To sculpt flesh, blood and bone into the forms we see in the concept art. But this was the magic of gods. And Vladimir could only execute small tasks even after concentrating all of his will. And more than that, in the Darkin society, it was forbidden to teach mortals how to wield blood magic. The punishment was death. But Vladimir's master found it amusing to make fun of his king. After all, they were already at war. Later, Vladimir confirmed that indeed he was the one who killed his master. Apparently, the master wasn't always good to Vladimir, and he still kept his cruel cool image. And to Vladimir, this final blow was vengeance for the years of pain he endured. This was the first story Vladimir told Mora. It was supposed to be a taste. Vladimir wanted her to know his full story in order to paint him another piece of history. But he also wanted to give her a chance to leave should she wish to do so. But Mora stayed and the journey through history continued. They ended up in a room with thousands of pink butterflies on the walls. Vladimir explained that this was his study collection. He only killed the butterflies moments before they would die naturally. By doing this, he learned about their lives. And by taking the lives from these individuals, he made sure the other butterflies will live in the gardens. And those butterflies don't live anywhere else in the world. Vladimir mentioned that just like his ancient godly masters, he chooses who lives and who dies. Again, mesmerized, Mora brushed the wing of one butterfly with her finger, only for it to turn into dust and start a chain reaction that would make hundreds of them crumble. Of course, all of those pieces of dead butterflies falling on her terrified her, and she ran down the corridor. She ended up at the center of a tower with spiraling staircase around its edges. A dim red light was shining from the peak of the tower. She smelled hot metal in the air, like the iron winds carried from the forges. Of course, we know that blood smells like iron, so the presence of blood magic in the tower became more obvious. That's when she noticed more paintings on the walls. But unlike the previous ones where Vladimir was young and handsome, these were from a very different time in his life. Some showed him middle-aged, and on some paintings Vladimir just looked dead. Then there was one depicting him bloodily wounded, in the aftermath of a great battle before a titanic statue of ivory stone. In the story, we didn't get more information on this painting, but we know it is Galio. Possibly from the short story where Galio fights back against Noxian warlocks and their great beasts. This is when Vladimir told Mora that all of these paintings came from great turning points in Vladimir's history. And all of these truly were from major events, be it good or bad for Vladimir's life. And for far too long, Vladimir was now focusing on staying alive and renewing himself. He told Mora that there are great events in the world that are slipping between his fingers. That's why he needed her, an artist with passion greater than talent, to paint him now. He saw the rise and fall of Mordekaiser, and many other leaders who climbed to power over thousands of corpses. He even learned about what lurks at the Empire's heart, the Black Rose. But even that is just cool spray. Vladimir was portrayed before he steps out of the shadows, and changes the course of the Empire. In the final scene, Vladimir emerged from the shadows as Mora accepted this time. And as the story describes Vladimir's long talons, I realized they were real. Those were the work of the Dark Blood Magic. To close this video, I want to say that I love how this story showed us how Vladimir affected history. It didn't just mention it without proof. Also, I love that we learned more about the Dark Noxus, and even the Shadow Eye. Vladimir is the first character whom I strongly believe was influential over the centuries. Hey, did you know that we have social media and Twitch where we talk about other lead facts and stories? And did you know that we have need mugs and shirts too? The links to all of that will be below. And as always, thank you, come again.